All right, I'll get started. So yeah, thanks, uh, thanks Tracy, and thanks, uh, thanks everyone for coming. Um, uh, you can ignore the cat; it's just there for cuteness reasons. Um, and uh, yeah, I'm really excited to uh, to to chat a bit more about this study. It's actually one of my favorite studies that, that I've done. Um, let's see. Uh, yeah, you can if you haven't already seen it, you can uh, you can get hold of it there. Um, it was a big kind of team effort, and um, I think we, I think we had some pretty useful and informative um, results out the back of it. So um, hopefully you can um, learn something from this study, maybe do something similar yourselves, and also learn from um, some of the things that we, some of the mistakes we made, or perhaps um, some of the things that we didn't do optimally. And I'll um, I'll tell you about those um, as I go. So um, let's start with the, um, I'll outline the problem that this research was trying to solve. Um, going back to basics, um, in principle, um, scientists um, don't blindly accept each other's claims. Um, instead, we take nobody's word for it in the, in the motto of the Royal Society. Uh, we require evidence and we require transparency um, about how that evidence was generated. And in modern research, that usually means um, having access to the raw data um, and also the analysis scripts. So in theory, we can reconstruct or reproduce the numbers that are reported in a particular research paper. Um, unfortunately, in practice, um, most scientists uh, don't share their data or their analysis scripts. And you can see the results here from um, several studies that my colleagues or um, others have run um, in, in different disciplines, trying to estimate the prevalence of various transparent research practices. And I've focused here on um, sharing of data and analysis scripts. So, Psychology, which is my own field, um, we estimate the prevalence of data sharing um, to be just 2% of articles and sharing of analysis scripts to be just 1% of articles. Um, so that means it's unclear whether um, many results are in fact reproducible. Um, and let me um, now define exactly um, what I mean by reproducibility because the term is often used in different ways. I'm referring here to what's called computational or analytic reproducibility, which means can we repeat the original analysis pipeline using the original data and obtain the original results? And there's a subtle difference between this term computational and, and analytic. Um, computational means usually um, when people use that, they're saying, can we take the raw data and the original analysis scripts and essentially click a button or click a few buttons and recreate the results? Analytic reproducibility, which is mainly what I'm going to be talking today, is a little bit different. All we need is the raw data, and we try to re-implement the original analysis simply by reading how it's described in the, uh, the original research article. So we don't require the, um, the original analysis script to do that. Um, so there's a subtle difference between those two things, but um, at their core, they're very, um, very similar. So how can we... Um, solve this problem of a lack of transparency, well, we might start to think about um, important um, leverage points in the scientific ecosystem that we might be able to um, act on in some way, we might be able to intervene on in order to improve this situation. So, you know, we might go out and we might write opinion pieces saying, you know, scientists should share their data because of this, this and this reason, and maybe we convince people and they start sharing their data. Um, perhaps we should also start making educational resources to help um, scientists with the logistics of sharing. Um, we might also start to think about different um, organizations that can influence scientists' behavior and, and what, their, um, uh, what their policies say. So I think all of these are potentially um, useful leverage points. Uh, the focus of the um, particular study I'm going to talk about today was on journal policy. And journals, of course, seem like a particularly promising leverage point because to some extent they are the gatekeepers of the scientific literature. Uh, they stand between scientists and um, publication. So a journal policy might be quite an effective way of changing scientists' behavior, in this case, um, getting them to uh, share data. And that brings us to the specific aims of uh, the study. Uh, the first aim was to see whether um, a journal policy um, can actually improve data sharing. We then wanted to know um, whether when scientists do share under that policy, if they do share, um, are they sharing data in a way that is reusable um, by other scientists? And then if we look at those reusable data sets, can we actually put that into practice and reproduce the results reported um, in those papers by repeating um, the original analysis pipeline? So let me get onto some um, methods. And um, I'm mainly going to be talking about that, um, that first aim of how we assess 
um, uh, the journal policy? And of course, that's a causal question. Um, we want to know um, whether that policy was effective and how effective um, that policy was. And the first thing that will come to mind is, well, just do an experiment. Um, that was, of course, the best research design we have for addressing um, causal questions. Unfortunately, um, doing a well-controlled experiment um, in a real-world setting, i.e. outside of the lab, can often be very logistically um, difficult. So in this context, um, first of all, we're going to require, require cooperation from a journal, um, and that's actually pretty hard to get. Um, first of all, it's actually often very unclear who the decision maker is at a journal. Um, is it the editor? Is it the advisory board? Is it the publisher? Um, it often varies between journals. Sometimes there isn't actually a relevant decision maker who will um, agree to these kinds of ideas, just a sort of deep bureaucratic void um, with lots of endless dead ends. So it's often not easy to convince a journal to, um, to engage in such a, an experiment or trial. Um, Journals um, are perhaps uh, perhaps reasonably uh, more concerned about upsetting potential authors with interventions rather than gathering evidence. Um, even if you do get permission to go ahead and run a trial, uh, authors might not cooperate with the trial, and that can lead to selection bias, particularly if there's preferential dropout in the intervention group, for example. Um, and then finally, if you are going to set up a, pr a prospective experiment, um, that's going to cost money, um, and it's also going to take a lot of time before you can see the results of that trial. So although an experiment is likely to get you the best, uh, most rigorous evidence, um, and if you find the opportunity to do um, an experiment in this kind of context, then you should definitely go for that option. Uh, in practice, uh, it's often not feasible, um, and what you're left with is um, doing an observational study. So that's exactly what happened in, uh, in our situation. Uh, we knew about a journal that had actually already introduced a, uh, a mandatory um, open data policy um, back in 2015. That's the, uh, the psychology journal Cognition. Um, and it required that authors publicly share their data in an online repository um, before their article um, uh, was published. And the policy even actually specifically states um, the data must be shared in a form that allows others to reproduce the original analysis. So this seems like the perfect context to run what we might call it a, um, a, a quasi-experimental study. And it's quasi-experimental because we, the researchers, do not have control over the intervention. There's no randomization here to a control group um, and an experiment, experimental group, rather it's a kind of natural experiment. This intervention has occurred in the wild and we now want to um, to study it. So we do have a situation that to some extent resembles an experiment and we can take advantage of that. So in this case you can think of the control group as being articles submitted before the policy was introduced and the intervention group as being studies submitted after the policy was introduced and our main outcome variable might be um, whether the articles are sharing data or not. And intuitively you might think well can't we just do a simple comparison of what happened before and, and what happened uh, afterwards? Uh, not so fast, because um, unfortunately, uh, we can't just do an observational study like that without consequences. Um, so in a proper experiment, we would obviously use randomization to try and ensure that the only difference between the experimental group and the control group is whether they are experiencing the intervention or not. But in a quasi-experimental situation, we don't have that randomization, um, and there are good reasons to suspect that in this case, the, the pre-policy group and the post-policy group are different in other ways that have nothing to do with the intervention. And we can call these uh, threats to validity, they're often called, um, and sometimes they can be quite serious. They can lead us into um, drawing erroneous conclusions, for example, thinking the policy is more or less effective than it actually is, um, uh, or, or just thinking the policy is effective when it actually isn't at all. Um, so there are, there are many different threats to consider. Um, to, uh, I'm just going to focus on the two most serious and relevant um, uh, here today. And uh, um, sometimes called uh, the maturation threat, which is um, that there could be a pre-existing um, uh, trend towards, in this context, data sharing in the pre-policy group. And the other one is called uh, the, uh, the history threat, which refers to the fact that there might be other um, events going on or even interventions going on um, that might affect the trends that you're observing. So um, let's um, dig in a little bit and, and illustrate these two 
uh, threats to validity. I've turned that study timeline I showed you before into a graph. Um, on the y-axis, um, on the y-axis, we have our outcome measure. That's the percentage of articles um, that are sharing data. And on the x-axis, we have time um, with a marker for the uh, the point at which the policy is introduced. So let's imagine um, this is these uh, red lines here are just going to be hypothetical um, trend lines um, for completely made up uh, data. Um, let's imagine that we're seeing an increase in the number of articles sharing data in the post policy period. Um, looks like the policy is working. Uh, unfortunately, if I showed you this line of a trend in the pre-policy period, um, then we'd say, oh, wait, so there was already an existing trend towards data sharing in the pre-policy period. And it looks like what we're seeing is just the continuation of that trend in the post-policy period. So the policy doesn't actually seem to be contributing anything at all. Uh, this is known as the maturation um, uh, validity threat. And we don't know if what we're seeing in the post-policy period is just a continuation of some pre-existing trend. Now imagine that we see uh, something like this. Um, yes, there is an increasing trend before the intervention, but then after the intervention, there's this accelerating increase after the, right after the policy is introduced. So surely that seems like good evidence that the policy is effective. Again, not necessarily. Um, so what if I tell you that in the post-policy period, um, a major academic society in the field of psychology also introduced um, an open data policy. Now, the difference that we're seeing here could be partly or even entirely due to that society's open data policy rather than our journal's um, open data policy. And there could be several um, other relevant events. Um, perhaps a major funder also introduces an open data policy or a convincing paper advocating for data sharing is published. All of these events could be contributing to the trends that we observe. Um, and of course, there could also be events that are reducing the amount of data sharing as well. So this illustrates the threat to validity from historical um, events that are occurring at the same time as, um, as our study. So what can we do uh, about those two threats to validity? So as I mentioned, a randomized control experiment would be the best way to, best way to deal with them, um, but doing experiments in applied settings is, is uh, often too difficult. Instead, uh, we could use something called uh, an interrupted time series design. So time series here is just referring to the fact that we're looking at how something changes over time. And the interrupted part refers to the fact that we have this intervention which is occurring uh, somewhere along this um, timeline. So this kind of design um, can't necessarily eliminate those threats to validity from maturation and uh, historical events, but in certain contexts, it can greatly reduce their plausibility. So it's not perfect, um, but it can give us some scaffolding upon which to make reasonable causal claims um, in an observational setting. So um, the first thing that an interrupted time series analysis enables us to do is to use the data from the pre-policy period to model what would have happened in the post-policy period if that existing trend had continued. And this is sometimes um, referred to as a counterfactual. Um, so on the graph here, you can see um, this hypothetical observed data represented by the solid lines. And then the counterfactual is represented by the dashed line. So if you wanted to estimate the causal effect of the policy while reducing the threat from maturation, um, we would no longer compare the post-policy period to the pre-policy period. Instead, we would compare what actually happens in the post-policy period to that counterfactual um, that we've estimated from the pre-policy period. Um, so um, that approach uh, does rely on some important assumptions. Um, for example, uh, we want to um, we want to make sure that we have enough data in the pre-policy period because um, we're using that to estimate the trend in the post-policy period. So that's one important assumption. Um, but in general, that can be used to um, reduce, uh, not eliminate, but reduce um, that threat from uh, the uh, uh, maturation. So um, we have uh, also this threat from historical events. Now, um, so recall that our concern here is that there's some other event or events going on that could be contributing to the observed trends. Um, let's say that we see a considerable improvement um, at the time point of the intervention. Um, as you can see on the graph here, we have this sudden level change, this sudden increase in data availability at the time point of the intervention. So the interrupted time series design 
means that um, historical events that we need to worry about um, that could be affecting that particular level change at that time point need to be events that are also having an effect at that time point. So in the context of our um, cognition study, we're not aware of any other relevant events that are happening at exactly that time, um, around the time of the intervention. So that gives us some confidence um, that we've reduced the validity threat from historical events. So it's we're most confident that that's not happening around the time of the intervention, but it is true that other events could be happening after the intervention that we're not aware of. So the further away we get from that intervention point, the more worried we should be that there's events that we don't know of that are contributing um, to that trend and that the interrupted time series analysis can't necessarily um, protect you from those the further away you get from the intervention point. Um, one way to address that is to add into your interrupted time series analysis a control group. So in this context, for example, we could also have measured data availability at an additional journal um, where there was no um, open data policy, and that could provide some additional um, protection from historical events. We didn't do that in this particular study. Of course, that would require a lot of additional data collection. And we were fairly satisfied that we um, were not aware of any um, uh, relevant historical events. But if you wanted a perfect design, I think you would have um, uh, added in a, a control group there. OK, so um, we decided to go with the interrupted time series design rather than experiment. The next decision that we needed to make was um, what was going to be the time frame um, of our study. So um, there's no, um, that are, as far as I'm aware, there aren't any kind of hard and fast rules about how to make decisions about time frames and sample size in the context of a uh, interrupted time series analysis. Um, it's possible that we could have done something a bit more formal here, um, but we um, made fairly arbitrary decisions, so sort of educated guesses. Um, our main concerns were that in the pre-policy period, we needed enough data to give us a reliable estimate of a counterfactual in the post-policy period. So we opted for um, a pre-policy period of one year um, in terms of how many articles uh, uh, had, been, had been published uh, during that time. And then uh, in the post-policy period, we looked at, um, uh, uh, again, a year after the intervention was introduced. And the relevant decision there was based on um, if we looked longer than a year, then uh, there could be lots of other events affecting the trends that we observed. So a year seemed like a good timeline to observe um, the effect of the intervention, but without too much contamination from um, additional events. So. Um, let me uh, yeah, just uh, explain a bit more about um, the procedures here. So for all of these um, articles in our within our sampling frame, um, we manually extracted um, information from them in duplicates. So that means we had two members of our team check every article. If there were any disagreements between those two team members, we had a third team member um, uh, come in and discuss and, and, uh, and decide what, um, what the, uh, the solution was. Um, so we checked to see whether there was a, a statement saying whether the data was available or not. Um, and then remember, our uh, second research goal uh, aim was to see if those shared data sets were actually reusable. Um, so we looked at three different um, measures of reusability. The first was accessibility. So could we actually download a file um, and, uh, and open it on our computers? Um, was the uh, data complete? So did it have all of the measured variables in the data set? And was it understandable? So was it properly labeled and well documented so we can actually figure out what the, uh, the data files meant? So um, I'm just going to show you some results for this first part of the study um, before I move on to the third research aim, which was checking um, uh, reproducibility. OK. So um, this graph is very similar to the one um, which I showed you a few moments ago with the hypothetical data. Um, you've got the outcome measure on the y-axis, that's the proportion of articles sharing data. On the x-axis, we have the, um, the submission date. Um, so note that our sampling frame was based on um, when articles were published, which went back to March 2014. But the x-axis here is actually showing when articles were submitted, which actually went all the way back to um, March 2010. And that's the most relevant thing here, because um, uh, whether the policy applies to an article or not is when it was submitted, not when it was um, published. So um, here you can see what happened in the pre-policy period. 
The red line is a logistic regression with 95% confidence intervals. And the circles are showing the proportion of articles which shared data, uh, and that's binned into 50-day time periods. So as you can see, there is an increasing trend towards um, availability even before the policy was introduced. And I hope at this point, you're all throwing things at your laptop screen and shouting validity threat from maturation, um, and you'd be right. Um, so this is exactly what we need to be worried about in an observational study and why we need um, an interrupted time series design. So um, here now you can see uh, the dashed line, which represent, represents our counterfactual estimate from that pre-existing trend of what might have happened in the post-policy period if that trend had continued. And here you can see what actually happened. So we have this marked level change at the time point of the intervention, and that's followed by this accelerated trend towards increasing availability. And that goes above and beyond what we would have expected compared to that um, counterfactual representing the pre-existing trend. So more specifically, um, our interrupted time series analysis suggests that an article that was published immediately after the policy um, had an estimated uh, 1.53 fold higher probability of sharing data compared to an article published immediately before the policy. And then additionally, um, that trend over time towards increasing data availability appears to accelerate in the post-policy period. Um, so the trend in the post-policy um, period was estimated to be uh, 1.14 times greater than in that um, uh, pre-policy period. So in raw numbers, um, there's a substantial increase from 25% um, of article sharing data across the entire pre-policy period to 78% in that post-policy period. And that's approaching 100% by the end of the assessment period, representing um, almost complete compliance with the, um, the mandatory data sharing policy. Um, and recall that we're not aware here of any other relevant historical event occurring at the same time as that intervention. Um, so uh, we believe that strongly indicates that there's a causal uh, effect um, of the policy. Okay. So um, briefly, I'll just mention the results from this these reusability checks that we did. And I'll um, put them all together, availability, uh, completeness, and um, uh, understandability. So 22% um, of the data sets that were shared in the pre-policy period met those reusability criterion, the rest did not. And in the post-policy period, 63% um, of the data sets appear to be uh, reusable according to those criteria. So there's some improvement, but even in the post-policy period, around a third of the data sets that are being shared don't seem to be um, reusable according to those criteria. So clearly there's a lot of um, uh, room for improvement there. So let's now um, uh, pop back to these research aims and um, I'm going to uh, we've addressed those first two. I'm now going to move on to this um, uh, third research aim. Um, we have a bunch of articles that have um, shared their data. Very few of them, though, shared analysis scripts. So rather than assessing the computational reproducibility, um, we decided we were going to check um, this uh, concept that I've described as analytic reproducibility. Can we repeat the original analysis pipeline by implementing the analysis in our own code based on the description we've read of the analysis process in the original article? We do have the original data and we want to compare what we get to the original results. And I would argue that this is a minimum uh, quality criterion that we expect all quantitative uh, research studies to achieve. Um, so, uh, of course, for this research aim, we're not trying to measure the causal effect of the policy. We're just trying to see whether it's achieving um, its stated goals. So essentially, we're going to compare whatever estimates of re re uh, reproducibility we come up with to 100% reproducibility, which is what is desired um, by the policy. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about uh, the methods for these reproducibility checks. Um, so... Uh, a major consideration that we were thinking about while making these decisions is how much time this was going to take. Um, uh, we did have a reasonably large team, I think roughly 10 people. Um, but um, we, after doing some piloting, we realized these things were going to take us quite a long time to do. So many of the decisions you see here are influenced by practical constraints, essentially. Um, I think if we did this study again, we might have tried to use some more sophisticated tools for um, to help us with the sample size planning um, for example, some kind of precision analysis. Um, but uh, at the time, uh, we basically made these decisions based on practical constraints. 
Um, so the first thing we did was to um, identify what I describe as a straightforward and substantive finding um, in some of the articles. So a straightforward finding meant that um, it came from a kind of uh, straightforward analysis. We operationalized this as being the kind of analysis you'd find in a typical undergraduate psychology um, statistics textbook. So we're talking about ANOVA's t-tests, basic descriptive statistics, nothing too fancy or elaborate. And again, that was for practical reasons. Um, and by a substantive finding, I mean one that's important to the conclusions of the paper. Typically, that would have been um, the first major conclusion that we came across in the paper, usually supported by um, a figure or a table. Um, and we looked at um, 35 um, articles that had already shared their data and had already passed those reusability checks. Uh, and we looked at 35 of them. Again, again, that's a fairly arbitrary sample size, but that's what we went with. Um, Oh, additionally, um, yes, yeah, so for each of those substantive findings, we're trying to reproduce all numerical values associated with that particular finding. So that includes the effect size, the p-values, um, but also the t-value and the degrees of freedom value, every single numerical value associated with that um, uh, particular finding. Um, so uh, let's see, and we had to decide how are we going to operationalize reproducibility? When do we say if something is reproducible or not? Um, we realized that we might, you know, find, let's say, a 3% difference between a value in our analysis and in the original analysis. Would that be meaningful or not? Um, and it could just be a difference that occurs because of the use of different software. So it's essentially meaningless. Um, in the end, we decided to have this 10% threshold. So if a value that we obtained in our analysis differed by 10% from the original analysis, we would consider that to be a major reproducibility error. And if an article contained any major reproducibility errors, then the overall article was considered to be not fully reproducible. Um, with hindsight, I'm not sure if that was the best uh, decision. The 10% cutoff is obviously arbitrary, um, and it might have been better to uh, just report the, um, the raw percentages and, and essentially let readers uh, make up their own um, minds about whether the difference was um, important or not. But we did need some way to summarize the results at the article level. So um, it's not clear whether this was a necessary thing to do or not. Um, and then finally, um, we tried, I think, everything we could think of to try and minimize the chance that we would make errors on our side. So I was desperately worried about, you know, saying that someone else had made a mistake in their published article. Um, so we put in a lot of measures to protect against that. Um, we used uh, what we called a co-piloting scheme, which meant that we had at least two members from our team running every single uh, reproducibility check together and checking checking the uh, the uh, code that they were writing. Um, and if we found any issues at all, we always wrote to the original authors um, and asked for their um, their opinion. So um, let me see how much time I've got. Okay, so. Um, I'll briefly tell you a little bit about the nuts and bolts kind of behind the scenes of, of what we were doing here in case you're interested. Um, so we aim to do absolutely everything in the open uh, and we did all of this via GitHub. So the GitHub repository was completely open and um, we essentially created a GitHub repository for every single reproducibility check, which had the relevant data file in it and the original paper. Um, and the um, we had extracted the, um, the relevant um, numbers that we were trying to uh, reproduce from each of those papers. Um, the, uh, the first uh, checker, the pilot, um, went ahead and performed their reproducibility check. They pulled that um, GitHub repo down to their computer and, and uh, did the check. They filled in a standardized uh, report document, um, which is a, an R markdown file, and used various um, standardized uh, custom functions that we'd written for checking the different percentage difference between values, again, to minimize the chance that um, one coder made a mistake. Um, we used something called PackRat for making sure that the software environments we were using between different computers was the same. That actually failed catastrophically in practice. Um, so don't use PackRat. Um, there's something called um, RNV now, which I think works a bit better if you're trying to do this yourself. Um, that's to ensure that there's not um, uh, on my own computer errors. So I'm making a mistake on my computer, but my colleague is not, and we can't work out why. Um, this kind of thing helps to make sure you have a stable um, environment that's shared on both computers. Um, the pilot completes their report, merges it with the original uh, GitHub repo, 
And then it's the co-pilot's turn. They did the same thing. They try and repeat the analysis. And then the first author of the paper, who is me, um, double checks everything, aligns the findings of the two reports, discusses it with both of the, the pilot and the co-pilot. Um, and then if there are reproducibility issues remaining after all of that, uh, we then send our reproducibility report, which was a um, an R markdown file, but you could also render it as a, a website, which um, uh, had all the code in it, but also plain language explanation of what we were doing. We sent that to the authors and asked them if they had any idea what was um, what was going on. Um, the end result of, of that process was that for each individual reproducibility check, we had this um, we had this nice report that we then put into a, um, a code ocean uh, module, which is um, a website you can use for having a stable computational environment. You can go to the individual reports for any of these and click a single button and it will reproduce the report from the, uh, the raw data. So let's look at um, some results from those reproducibility checks. Um, first of all, I'm going to show you the results uh, from before we contacted the original authors. Um, and I'm also going to, uh, as well as the 35 articles we looked at from the cognition study, um, I'm also going to throw in the results of 25 articles from an additional study we did, which was very similar, but looked at the journal Psychological Science. So um, here you can see that um, for both journals, only about a third of the articles um, we examined were classified as being uh, reproducible before we contacted the original authors. And we're using a, a kind of mini meta-analysis meta here to combine the results of the two um, studies, which, which, as you can see, are very similar anyway. Um, now I'll show you what happened uh, to the reproducibility success rate after we contacted the original authors. It improved so that actually about overall two thirds of the articles we were looking at uh, were reproducible after contact with the um, original authors, which means that in about a third of articles, there is at least one numerical value that neither we nor the original authors know um, how to uh, reproduce. Um, so, uh, some important uh, caveats and context here. The first is that um, uh, the kind of advice and uh, information we were given by original authors uh, was, except in one case, information that was not actually included in the original papers. So we couldn't possibly have known ourselves. Um, the one case was that there was a footnote in the original paper that we had missed. And if we'd read that, we would have been able to reproduce the values. Um, so all of these, uh, this improvement from one third to two thirds is actually coming from additional information that wasn't in the papers. That was typically um, uh, authors clarifying um, what the analysis process was, which in the original paper was incomplete, uh, unclear, or sometimes incorrect. Uh, sometimes the original authors provided new data files and said that there were errors or missing data in the original ones. Um, Another way of uh, thinking about these results is in terms of the um, overall error rate. So at cognition, uh, overall, we checked 1,324 values. There were 64 major numerical errors. That's a 5% error rate. And at psychological science, we checked 789 values and found 37 errors, which is also a 5% um, overall error rate. So all of this is sounding quite bad, but there's a very important caveat, which is that Though we identified um, reproducibility issues in most um, papers, we didn't find any particular patterns of errors that made us strongly suspicious of the author's original conclusions. And there's a few reasons for that, partly because we only focused on um, one part of the paper rather than the entire paper. So it's difficult to be in a position to um, uh, undermine the overall conclusions of the paper because we didn't check everything. Um, also, the um, sometimes we would see errors in values like the degrees of freedom or the T value, but the other values were OK, like the effect size was fine, for example, we could reproduce that. So it wasn't always entirely clear whether there was a problem for the original conclusions uh, or not. Some further investigation might suggest there is, or um, it might suggest that these were kind of isolated um, uh, issues. OK. Um, that brings me back to um, an earlier kind of decision we made, which was to look at numerous values related to a particular finding. And with hindsight, it might actually have been uh, easier to interpret these results if we just focused on effect sizes and inferential statistics like p-values, for example. So that's that's a decision that you might want to um, uh, think about if you're doing something like this yourself. 
Um, so uh, I will just mention um, one final important finding from this, which was that each of these reproducibility checks was taking us somewhere between two hours and 25 hours to complete. And that's for, you know, basically a paragraph or two of information, maybe a figure or a table in each in each article. Um, clearly, that's unacceptable if we want the reuse of data to become routine. We can't have everyone having to repeat uh, the original analysis and take 25 hours to do it. Um, uh, so clearly, there needs to be um, some improvement in, in how we um, how we uh, share data with each other and ensure that um, these kind of analyses are, are very quickly reproducible um, by independent authors. Okay, so um, and I'll just also just mention that uh, you know the goal of these projects is to lead to improvements in policy, not just to throw another paper into the void. Um, so it's very encouraging to see that the editorial team at Cognition uh, wrote this response to our empirical study and they did update their policy. Um, it didn't go quite as far as we'd hoped, so they, they made some updates in terms of um, advice for authors in terms of how they should share their data. Um, one suggestion we had is that um, as well as requiring data, the journal should require sharing of analysis scripts because that would have cleared up a huge number of problems and, and uh, hopefully being much quicker to run these checks. Uh, but they didn't want to uh, they didn't want to go that far in this case. Um, I'll just uh, mention a couple of kind of, you know, with with hindsight points of like things that we might have done differently. Our general approach here was to go to great lengths to measure reproducibility in a circumstance that heavily favored reproducibility success. So um, we were looking at analytic reproducibility um, rather than computational. So we didn't require that authors were sharing their analysis scripts. We had this co-piloting model, which of course doubled, doubled the amount of effort that we had to put in. We contacted the original authors um, and we really wanted to make sure that um, you know, we knew whether or not there were errors in the original manuscript or not. Now, um, I, you know, I'm, I'm proud of that effort we put in, and I think it was good and a useful thing to do. Um, if you're thinking that sounds crazy, I'm never going to do that, then I think you know this might be of interest. I think there is a uh, a practical question you can ask, which would take less effort, and that's something like, you know, could someone with reasonable training, could one person with reasonable training, reproduce the results of this study within a certain amount of hours? And you'd, you'd have to vary that, I think, based on the complexity of the study. But that would be a bit more of a practical question, like, you know, if I'd send my data and my analysis scripts to a journal and they have someone check, um, you know, can they can they reproduce the results within a couple of hours? If they can't, send it back to the authors and it's up to them to kind of resolve the issues. So there's a more practical question you can ask, I think, which would um, uh, be a bit easier than the, than the approach we took. OK, I'll end with just a few general takeaways. So in certain contexts, um, an interrupted time series analysis can be um, an informative way to evaluate an intervention um, if an experiment is not feasible. Um, you must, of course, be aware of those validity threats and consider that um, uh, in your design as well as in your um, conclusions and how confident you are about making causal conclusions. Um, and then finally, these uh, analytic reproducibility checks can be important, informative, but they do require considerable work. Um, and you might want to take a more um, practical approach if you've uh, if you've got less time. So thanks so much for for listening, and um, yeah, really happy to um, take any questions and, and discuss with you what you think about the study. Thanks.